Good morning, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session of Rumination with Andrew. Thank you for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And this morning, sorry, I would like to discuss and perhaps pose this important question. Is there a nexus between the political world in Jamaica and the underworld, the world of criminality, the world of drug trafficking, and um, you know, and all of those substance abuse is there really a link? And do we have criminal elements supporting our politicians? That has been a question, or you know, it has been the talk of town since I was a little boy. That indeed, <clears throat> Jamaican politicians are notorious for um, interacting with and also engaging in business activities, illicit business activities with members of the underworld, right? With members, with drug traffickers and with um, gun totting criminals and dons, right? And it has been something that some people believe and some people don't believe. They think that their politicians are clean and that their politicians are too sophisticated, particularly the ones who have graduated from the Harvard universities, right? And from the Oxfords, how could they be involved um, with or in criminal activities? Something is amiss here. And many people ask that questions and they would rather, that question I should say, and they would rather ignore, you know, delving into it and seeing for yourselves if there are enough evidence to support, to corroborate that sort of thesis. Something that we need to think about, something that we need to reflect on, because we are living in a, in a time now where, you know, anything goes, right? Our politicians are conditioning and the media in conjunction with our politicians are conditioning the people of the world that anything goes. You know, everything that is moral is morals are no longer absolute. They are relative, it depends on how you view it. So if you think that you need to kill somebody to get to where you are, then that's it. Because guess what? I'm killing the person and I'm striving for a better life. I'm striving for a better position. That is what we're seeing right now. That the end justifies the means. The end justifies the means. That's where we are right now in our society. A society that is immoral and it's from top to bottom, including sometimes some of our religious personalities and characters, right? Where, because even in the church, politics has also seeped within the church and this cultural revolution, this Marxist cultural revolution that there is no God, and we are just here by ourselves. And God, there is no being, there is no superior being that requires certain morality from his creatures, from his creation. That is a sort of education system that we are actually engulfed in. And it is very, very disgusting when you look at what is happening in higher education worldwide, worldwide wide, the level of ignorance, the level of darkness, the level of backwardness in our universities. But people think that they're writing papers, they're enlightened minds. And I'm not saying here that in some cases you might not have some very important papers produced. But I must say here, for the most part, our education system is farcical. It is a farce and it's a scam. To a great extent, our education system is a scam and hundreds of thousands of people are spending millions or thousands of, of dollars, right, to be educated, but I would say to be more indoctrinated. And it might be necessary because you have to function in the world and that is how the system is set up, that you have to go through these colleges and universities Oftentimes, they are not empowering the minds of children, of, of, of young people, right? And that is when the young mind is more susceptible 
and vulnerable to all sorts of indoctrination. And for the most part, it will set you for life or it might destroy your mind for life. Something that we have to think about, something that we need to grapple with and ensure that we are not in any way deceived by what we see going on in our universities and to a lesser extent in at the secondary level of education. But something is wrong. Something is wrong with our world in terms of how we view our leaders and the fact that everything our leaders say, people believe. We still believe that our leaders are telling us the truth. Even when it is there in our face that our leaders are not telling us the truth, they're lying to us. They are disseminating half truths to us, which essentially are lies. If they're telling you half truths, it means that ultimately it's a lie because truth is the truth and it cannot be adulterated. You can't, there's nothing as an adulterated version of the truth. The truth is the truth. Yes, it might be painful, but it is the truth and you, act, you have to accept nothing but the unadulterated, unvarnished truth. Something that you need to understand. You know, the entire system is built on deception. And you know I have done that, for those of you who have not watched it, the war is behind all wars. And we know that war started in heaven. You know, and that angel that was so uplifted, that was so exalted, that God gave every gift that he could, he had in his, in, in his bag, all the gifts he has and still has, right? And he turned against God because he wanted to be God because he had all these gifts. He thought that he was God himself and our politicians, because we have given them power, they are reigning supreme over us and they think that we are their subjects and they are sovereign, right? They have taken over the place of God and many of you worship your politicians and you worship them to death. You will worship them to death. In Jamaica, we have a system where people do not read as they ought to read. And I also say it's worldwide, a worldwide trend now because people tend to, they prefer to be on online, on Instagram and on Facebook and on TikTok. Right, And if they do read sometimes, they're not reading books that they need to read, heavy books, books that will let you know that how the world operates. And I'm always amazed when I read the Bible and I see how the master teacher in the person of Christ came here. And whilst he was educating his disciples, they still preferred to listen to what the rabbis had to say. Right. Because the rabbis to them were respected scholars in the scriptures, in the scriptures then, right? In the Torah. And they believed the persons who, the, 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 the man, the, the, the God, Christ, who gave that wisdom to the rabbis, they, did, they were sometimes hesitant. Not that they willingly and they intentionally wanted to do it, but because their minds were so brainwashed by what they'd heard in the synagogues, by these so-called scholars, and the respect that they had for them, they could not understand what Christ was saying to them. So all the deceptions that he was trying to unveil and to unmask, they did not understand. They blocked their minds against understanding those deceptions that they were eventually deceived when Christ died. Had they listened to him, they would not have been weeping and mourning, weeping and wailing when Christ died. Had they listened, but they didn't listen. They thought that they knew and they thought that what the rabbis had to say, the rabbis had an in-depth understanding of the world, right? Um, same way in which you think that these people who are coming from universities, from the Oxfords and then from the Harvards and the Princetons and the Yales, you think that they are endowed with enormous intellectual capacities and you have to listen to every word that comes out of their mouths. 
because they have written 30 books and 50 books, <laughs> right? And you think that that means, therefore, that they can unmask deceptions. I dare tell you that a lot of what is happening in our universities today, many of our professors, I would say, I would dare say 90% of them are deceived because they're living in this world of illusion where everything is built on false theories coming from people like the Platos, right? And they think that that's what's make them intellectual. They sound intellectual, but oftentimes they are just mere robots, um, robotically articulating what another man has said, whilst rejecting what the God of heaven in the word of God has to say on the matter, right? Now let's get back on track to what we're here about. And I, I asked the question, I posed the question at the beginning of this video, is there a nexus between the political world in Jamaica and the underworld, the criminal elements, the, the world of the dons and, and the drug lords and the drug kingpins? Now let's listen to this brief video that I had, this you know, is a brief clip of a video that I, um, you know, pulled up on TikTok yesterday. Um, please listen, and you can form your own analysis, you know, because we need to learn how to think. Let me, yeah, let me pull this up and get it here. I think it might be here. Oh, did I not? No, it's right here. Okay, sorry about that. Where is it? I have to. Oh, Lord. Sorry, let me get it now. So. Tired from politics and writes political commentary because violence is so intertwined with politics in this country. From the next election, is it the party that has the most muscle? Party that has the most guns? Let's, let's restart uh, it. Let's restart it. Let me start. As the opposition TNP administration, he's now retired from politics and writes political commentary because violence is so intertwined with politics in this country. Come to the next election. Is it the party that has the most muscle? The party that has the most guns? That's the The party that comes to the elections with the most money and the most unconsequent because it's impossible to bear must be of the money. Oh, that is size of time. You're the big source of money, the drug barons. Drug barons who you know, even put it on times. It's on the basis that they expect something in exchange. And most obviously, it must be that the government of the day will turn the blind eye to the operations which made the contributions as possible. We have made it absolutely clear lives we constantly about it. There are constant instructions about it. That we do not wish to be penetrated or associated with the government, that we do not wish and that we intend to fight this thing. Michael Manley, in his bid for prime minister, is now leading in the polls. Prime in Waterhouse. And I have a guy who's got hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000. I've got guns. And you're a politician in that country. How can you not do business with me? You want influence that him. I tell you this, I'm a politician. No power. There is no power known to man. If I'm a politician in that neighborhood, do I not happen to know the people who have influence? And if I'm a drug baron and I've got to the extent that there are persons who have no connections that have been placed, they are there, but they are one of them. That's as close to an admission as one can get from Siaga that the party has no choice but to deal politically with drug barons. He denies that his party takes drug money, 
but accuses his opponent's party, the PNP. There's been one notable instance in which one of the leading drug barons actually made the donation. The floor of the country. And who is that? No, I would like to call him one second. Uh, you want to research him? Right? I, I know who the man is, but you're saying this man is a drug dealer. No, he's not. Very well. How do you know? All intelligence must No question. No question. No question. You're, there's no question in your mind, Kenneth Black is a drug dealer, a drug bear. But you said that. But you're saying to me that that person is a documented drug bear. No question. This is Kenneth Black. He's made a farce of the Reagan administration's war on drugs. Not only does the Jamaican prime minister call him a drug baron, but the Drug Enforcement Administration has had him under investigation for months. Posse members tell us that he's a major supplier of several U.S. cities, yet he's never been convicted or even arrested. He travels freely between the U.S. and Jamaica. Officials say he spent millions on businesses and property in both countries, and he's made no secret of his interest in the upcoming election. He had a major contributor. You honored hundred thousand dollar contribution. Just a, just a pause here a second. When we look at the opening video, right, with Arnold Bertram, and the fact that he's suggesting that these drug barons or drug overlords or drug kingpins, whatever you want to call them, do support politicians, because let's not make any bones here. We've got to speak the truth that to be able to run for political office, it costs a whole lot of money. And a lot of people do not have that arm and leg that it requires, right? So it means, therefore, that they have to resort. I shouldn't say they have to, but they resort. They often resort to these illicit means of being able to um, gather funds. Another thing, when you're running for political office in, country, in poor countries like Jamaica, you've got to give people some spoils, right? You've got to help them. Uh, with their school fees. You, you've got to help them with their uniforms. You've got to help them with paying a bill here and there. So it, it means, therefore, that politicians have to have deep pockets. The system is built on this sort of corruption. It's the system, the way how the system is designed and built. Because I do not think that our politics should be involved in this sort of money-making venture in terms of, and it's not only in Jamaica, it's in the United States, where you have to have millions of dollars to be able to stand up against your opponent and to win him or her. It requires a lot, a huge quantity of money, huge sums of money that a lot of times people do not have. And, you know, even though they get some from the formal business communities. And you will hear from Mr. Siaba that a lot of the times what we think are formal business institutions, including some of the businesses on in, in Hollywood Dan, and on Wall Street are also involved in the underworld, in the world of the of drugs and you know such the like. So we tend to think of drug kingpins and drug lords as these people are unsophisticated, unsophisticated, but they are just the middleman. Right, The top men are the ones that you're seeing in Parliament, in Congress, and also in a lot of these large and medium-sized corporations. And you've got to understand that. That is how the system is designed. That's how it was made to be. And if you read the book One Nation Under Blackmail by Whitney Webb, right, you will learn a lot of how the underworld is connected to what we call the is it the overworld, right? Or what we know to be the mainstream world, right? In terms of the institutions that we should respect and we think that are not normally involved in elements like these, in criminal elements like these. But why do you think we have a problem with crime and violence, for example, in Jamaica? Because we know that our institutions or our so-called respected institutions are also involved or are connected. There is a nexus between these institutions and the underworld, drug trafficking, drug running, you know, and all of these things. And it's time for us to begin to be aware of these things. We might not be able to screen them because, you know, it's dangerous, a very dangerous and 
insecure world and you can lose your life for doing that. Um, Gary Webb is an example of such and he was the one who, let me tell you who Gary, Gary Webb is. Very important that we know who this guy is. Let me see if I can share my screen here and tell you who Gary Webb. I'm coming down to the end of the video. I'm not gonna be long today. So we have here Gary Webb. He began his career for newspapers in Kentucky and Ohio, winning numerous awards and building a reputation for investigative writing. Hired by the San Jose Mercury News, Webb contributed to the paper's Pulitzer Prize winning um, coverage of the Loma Prieta earthquake. Now, look at what he's best known for, and you can read that book too. I think it's online. He's very, very well known for Dark Alliance. Webb is best known for his Dark Alliance series, and he did make that book, even though there were a series of articles, but he actually upgraded it, all these articles, these series of articles into a book um, called The Dark Alliance. And it can be accessed online and read it. Webb is best known for his Dark Alliance series, which appeared in the Mercury News in 1996. The series examined the origins of the crack cocaine trade in Los Angeles and claimed that members of the anti-communist Contra rebels in Nicaragua had played a major role in creating the trade using cocaine profits to finance their fight against the government in Nicaragua. It also stated that the Contras may have acted with the knowledge and the protection of the Central Intelligence Agency. The series provoked outrage particularly in the Los Angeles African-American community and led to four major investigations of its charges. You can go, this is um, online from the Wikipedia, but there are lots of writing and write up about Gary Webb, right? A very fascinating investigative journalist who this week he was suspiciously killed I think sometimes in 2000, can't remember the date, but you can read more about Gary Webb and read The Dark Alliance and see how the trafficking of drugs into the black community, for example, right? To destroy the community. And then to say that these people are inferior, you know, lots of things happen behind the scenes that we have to go and unmask. And we are to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. God expects us that we will have knowledge and that we will accrue knowledge so that we can gain wisdom because wisdom is the principal thing. And many of you do not have the wisdom. And a part of gaining wisdom is to what? To have understanding. That's what the Bible says. In all your wisdom, get understanding. And that's why you hear me all the time talking about knowledge, wisdom, and an understanding because that is is very important. And these are things that a lot of times people have one, they might have a lot of knowledge, right? But they do not have the wisdom. And they might not have a lot of knowledge, but they don't have the understanding of how to connect the, these important elements together to synthesize. Because one of the problems we're having in universities right now, including with professors, is that they're not able to make connections. They can't synthesize. And if they can't do that, then they're not really true scholars. All of that is just uh, you know, farce. And that is why the university is not playing the role that it should be playing in most countries, including countries like Jamaica. But let's continue with the video and let's not digress here. Let me share my screen again with you so that you can listen to what our, poli our slick politicians um, have to say. So share and begin. Let's begin. Or at least said it was $100,000. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember this very open. You brought it up in a bit box in his name. Not on it. No, I, I just remember seeing the guy arrive with a box in my hand. Don't, don't. Can it fly? Is that it? You don't remember? No, I don't. I don't know if I ever put it. I may have, but I don't remember this. But he, in fact, gave a substantial amount of money. For no, I tell you, he came with a box that contained $100,000. Put it down and go to the platform and he said, That's what I think of the other stuff. And he walked in a whole crowd of this in the apartment. I turned to my colleagues and I remember saying, Who is that? And let me just straight you out. No colleague of mine, no friend of mine, no associate of mine. Just put that one there. 
Isn't it? Is, sorry, isn't it? Is it? Isn't it interesting that Michael Manley, former prime minister of Jamaica, talked about this kind of black, right? The journalist, the American journalist, was asking him, you know, weren't you friendly with him? Um, didn't, didn't he support your campaign, your political campaign? And Michael Manley saying that, yes, you know, when I was giving a speech, I saw this man and he came with a bag, <laughs> right? A bag full of cash and um, and just dropped it there and walked away. Now, you would have thought that Michael Manley, who was then perhaps opposition leader, I can't, I, you know, it seems to me that Siaka was in power when this interview was done, um, but he was opposition leader. He was a man in authority. And you're telling me that he just allowed him to walk away. You didn't call the police. You did not, you know, apprehend him. Nothing happened. He, he just came up with a bag of money, lots of loads of money, lots of cash, and just walked away like that. You just ask him, oh, this guy seems to be braggadocious and, you know, and just allow him to have, you know, ridden into, 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 into the, or disappeared into thin air. Right, it's like what is happening, or what was happening in Jamaica at the time, but it's still happening, and that's the sad reality that whatever happened then is still happening now. And our politicians need to be held to account. They need to be held to account, and oftentimes we turn a deaf ear, a blind eye, right, because we do not want to come to grips with this reality that indeed our politicians are connected and perhaps sometimes you not because they want to be connected but that is how the system is designed in terms of if you are going to win the election you've got to come up with loads of money it's almost like a man having or wanting to have a wife that she always wants to be you know titivated and wants expensive stuff and you might not be having that money you might not be a man that has that job in which you can take care of such a woman right but if you decide that you want to to, to have that lady then you will have to do things and some of the things might be illicit some of the activities in which you are engaged might be illicit activities in order to maintain such woman right and that is what happens many of these men they go on, and women, they go into politics, they might not be involved in these things or were not involved with them previously, but because the system is designed that way and because they love politics and they want the power, they have no other choice or they believe that they have no other choice, but if they want to win, that is, but to be engaged in such illegal activities. All right, so that's interesting. They don't operate Arnold Bertram, like many Jamaican political analysts, believes that drug barons with their guns and money have become so entwined with the neighborhood politicians of both parties that they now desperately need one another to survive. Once drug barons have got themselves in a position where they can become brokers, the politicians either have to drive them, wipe them out. I don't think there are any alternatives here. And there's no evidence that they are having no sorry. Yeah, did you hear what he Oliver Bertram said said? Um he said that that the both politicians and these drug barons need each other because the politicians need the money, right? They need the cash to be able to to um to instigate and to um you know. To, to do to, to to conduct their political campaigns and to finance, I should say, for want of a better word, to finance their political campaigns. And it, it means therefore, and the drug barons, I should say, need the politicians to protect them. Right? Need the politicians through the justice system to protect them. And right now, what was back then and what is happening in Jamaica now. Is, and what we see happening in Haiti is that the criminal elements have become more empowered than the politicians because they have more money now. So they can buy out the justice system and they have also bought out our politicians. 
So that is a difference between what happened back then and what is happening now. At that time, these drug barons were coming up to power. And as they contend for power, they were able to give the politicians money so that they could win elections. Having won the elections, they would give them lots of contracts and also protect them through the justice system because that's the only way they're going to be protected. Because when they go to the law, then they can, you know, oil the hands or the palms of the of the judge or the lawyers, and then they will go scot-free. Right? And this is what is happening in modern Jamaica and is oh, it happened in Haiti. We're now seeing where Haiti is on its knees because years of that, this this is a consequence that we will eventually have an illegitimate government in which criminal elements are running the show. The main drug dealers are drug buyers are not possible. There are people who pass a wisdom. The profits that are made and never come back to them. It's all in your country. You know, this is very important that we highlight what Mr. Sierra is saying. Even though he has obfuscated and he has you know, tried to deflect from the, the questions posed to him and to blame others for his own culpable activities, but yet he's saying something here that is true. Remember now that we say that sometimes our politicians do say things that are true, and it's very important that we be able to embrace, we can embrace the truth that they have divulged. And Mr. Sierra has just said that the real drug barons are not the ones that are a part of the posse, like the shower posse. They are the ones in business suit, in offices, in corporations. They are the drug barons. And he is telling him that most of the money that comes from drug trafficking remains in the United States of America, right? That is where the money is. And these are the real drug barons, the ones on Wall Street and, you know, and all in these high-tech companies that we so respect and we want to work for, right? This is where the money is. And we think, wow, we hear all these people and the billions of dollars they have. And we do not know that a lot of times some of these money and business activities are involved, right? With criminal or in criminal elements, something that we need to educate ourselves about. So, process have nothing to do with that level of operation. To the extent that they are sending any money back to Jamaica, is the same category of Jamaican migrants who go abroad and work decently and earn their living and through their own prosperity, send money back to Jamaica to their families. When you talk to prosecutors, law enforcement people, judges, the United States, it's very clear that a large influx of weapons are coming into the bank. Hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars coming into the bank from the drug trade in Kansas City, New York, Miami. Where's that money going and where are those guys? That's one thing that I can tell you about them. It's not going to the Let's keep up my mind. All the country can check them out of the Wow. Wow. That's interesting that that was coming from the young Arnold Bertram. <laughs> I wonder if he would say um, he would make a similar statement today. But that was an interesting snippet or, you know, um, you know, um, it's an interesting video. And I hope that you have learned something from it because, you know, these are questions that we need to pose and these are realities that we need to grapple with and we need to be concerned about because it is posing a threat to democracy as we know it, right? I, I don't believe that we have any pure democracy, but at least we have some remnants of freedom. But this, if we allow these things to take over, we are going to definitely lose all the freedoms that we have ever fought for. And look at what is happening in Haiti. I think, as you know, as I am saying Haiti, I think that country is now irredeemable. When you have a situation in which criminal elements have taken over 
it's the end of the day. If that's the end of the story, that's, you know, you've lost your country, right? Because they you never can restore the decency that you need because you're talking about serious conflicts over money, right? And power that the this entire underworld provides you know, both members of the overworld and members of the underworld, which are in bed together or who are in bed together, right? All of these people are in bed together. And we are the ones who think that, oh, no, it's a guy on the street. It's the Jimmy Cherizier and these guys who are the bad guys and the bad actors and our politicians who are dressed in, you know, ties and they have... Nice suits, right? You believe what they say, right? And they are coming from Harvard University, or from the Oxford or from the University of the West Indies. You think that they are clean and that they're pure and that they're sophisticated. And anything they say to you, you believe them. But behind closed doors, you do not know what they do, right? And the activities, the illicit activities in which, in which they are engaged and it's time for you to understand that, to grow up and to just expose your minds to other alternatives. People ask, how did we get here? These things have been happening from the devil was a boy. And if you were just reading the history, interacting with the history and seeing how history interacts with what is happening or impacts on what is happening currently, then you would understand how we've got here. Because this, this, what we're seeing today is nothing. It's just that it has reached a crescendo. You have been ignoring all of these things all over the years because we have been miseducated. We have been misinformed. We have been disinformed, <laughs> right? And because of that, we did not pay attention to the telltales, right? And to the signs that were often put on the wall, right? The signs that were often on the wall. We did not pay attention to those signs because we are living in this la la land, this world of illusion, our minds are deluded, right? And therefore, when the world now is coming, everything is coming crashing down, it's coming, everything is now being demolished. All our institutions are now um, being totally devastated and destroyed. Then we begin to cry wolf. But if we were paying attention, we would have noted long ago that this was coming. But I just wanted to show you, to highlight this video, to show you how slick our politicians are. And look at how Mr. Siega was there blaming the other party, even though there are lots of evidence to have to suggest that his party and members of his own party, the JLP, the Jamaica Legal Party, was involved in these illicit drug running activities. Thank you so much for joining. I hope to see you in another video. And please remember to like and to share and to subscribe subscribe and like the videos. If you don't like the videos, the videos will not be shared on this platform. It's not about just viewership. It's about liking. That's how YouTube operates. And they're strange right now. I can tell you we're not living in the democratic world that you think you're living in. And information is not democratic as you think it is. And that's why you have to like the videos. So the videos can be shared and people can become informed. And by so doing, become empowered. Thank you so much. All the best.